Alrighty, it is three o'clock, so we're gonna go ahead and get started here. Welcome everyone. Um, if your camera for some reason allows you to turn it on, please disable it for whatever reason it is overriding um, certain settings. I'm not sure what's going on, my apologies. Um, so at any rate, for those of you that don't know me, I am Brent Davis. I'm a digital accessibility analyst here at TU. I am based out of OTS. Um, my team consists of myself and two student uh, digital accessibility consultants, Jasper and Leilani, who are uh, in our audience today. Um, we are bringing you this session in coordination with our digital, or excuse me, our accessibility special interest group, which is a um, or organization on campus for, for anyone, faculty or staff with an interest in accessibility and kind of talk about goings on in the industry, things we can do at campus to make lives for everyone better, uh, make sure we, we have a more equitable um, environment, etc. Um, with that said, before we get too started here, just to FYI, everyone is muted and uh, all the video should be off. If, if for some reason the video comes on, I will try to disable it. There seems to be a small bug there. Um, we will get to a Q&A portion later in the meeting and in the event. And I know some of you submitted some really great questions already. Thank you very much. Um, we'll also use, have the opportunity to raise hand and reach questions or to ask some questions. Um, hopefully we'll get through them all, but we might not have quite enough time to get through everything. Um, just to FYI, if you have questions specific to accessibility here at Towson, um, something with a course you're in um, or anything with student life, we do have our accessibility and disability services department uh, available to answer questions for you. If you are faculty or staff and you've encountered something uh, problematic that you'd like somebody's opinion on, feel free to reach out to me. That, that That's uh, you know what I'm here for is to take a look at and provide consultations. So without further ado, I would like to introduce everyone to our, our guest today, Ross Miner. Um, Ross is a swimmer. He is in the midst of training to hopefully go to Tokyo next summer. Ross is also a gamer and a uh, accessibility advocate and evangelist. And he's a, uh, he knows Jasper, one of my student workers. And when Jasper told me about Ross, it really seemed like this seemed like a great opportunity just to kind of spread spread the word about uh, you know assistive technology and and d frankly dispelling some misconceptions that a lot of people have with with disability so with that said i am going on mute and turning my camera off and i'll hand it over to ross uh, oh if you pardon me if you require or if you would benefit from captioning we have been uh, enabled closed captioning for this meeting there is a link provided with the meeting invitation, which you can use to uh, access the captions. Alternately, um, you can just go onto the Zoom screen and at the bottom where it says closed caption, there should be a little arrow, arrow icon that you can click to show subtitle and you can view it right here as part of the meeting. With that said, I am truly going to mute and stop showing myself. <laughs> Here's to you, Ross. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Brent. <clears throat> Yes, so my name is Ross Miner, and seriously, thank you so much for all of you who are coming out here. It's, it's crazy to see how many people are interested or even just support, oops, I just hit my mic, the accessibility movement. Like back when I was at college at UNF in 2017, yeah, 2017, there was no accessibility club or anything like that. Like it, it was, it's crazy to see how, how far the accessibility movement has gone. But anyway, my name is Ross and I am completely blind. As Brent said, there's a lot about me to unpack. I'm an accessibility advocate. I'm a Paralympic swimmer. I'm an avid gamer slash nerd, um, all of the above. I'm kind of a jack of all trades and I'm here to talk to you all about accessibility, why it matters, how it's impacted my life, and how, it's, how it even impacts your life, even if you don't have a disability. So where do I even begin? I'm sure most of you guys are asking, how, how are you blind? How'd you go blind? Were you born blind? And that's what I'm gonna answer. Um, this is a very sad story. So I do say trigger warning very seriously. Um, if this is, this may be a story that may impact you some way because it's a very emotional story. But so with that being said, uh, to preface, when I was eight on June 14th, 2006, um, I was shot in my sleep by my father. 
So the way it happened was that he shot me in my sleep and then he went to my brother's room, shot him in his sleep and then committed suicide on the spot. And he did this. There, there are many reasons and it's not the point of this discussion, but that he was, he was a narcissist. He was a sociopath and my mother was divorcing him. And if anyone knows anything about narcissists, like that was the kind of the final straw for him. He had no other outs. Um, that was his way of, of getting back at her, at hurting her. Um, so I was rushed to the hospital. My brother, Ryan, unfortunately did not survive and neither did my dad. And so I was left blind and more specifically the retina and optic nerve of my right eye are severed. And then my left eye is completely fake. Like I could just tap it like that. Sorry if that grosses you out, but it's completely fake. Um, and then I also can't smell either. I lost a se my sense of smell. So technically I only have three senses. Um, but yes. Yeah, so when I went blind, I didn't feel anything. I hardly remember anything. All it was is that I went to bed with sight and woke up in a hospital bed completely blind, just couldn't see anything at all. And <laughs> that was kind of like the BC to AD of my life, the before and after, you know, you guys see that meme going around. <laughs> uh, that, that was pretty much me. How am I going now? Well, when I went blind or before I went blind, I loved video games. I played video games on the Nintendo 64, the PS2, the GameCube, that era. My brother was the outdoorsy type and I was the indoorsy type, loved to play video games, just more of an analytical thinker. Well, when I went blind, it was like, how, how am I gonna be able to play video games? How am I gonna be able to do that? Obviously I was eight. So the first thing I was thinking of was, how am I gonna play video games? But my mom was thinking, how, am I, how is he even gonna go to school? I went blind and my mom was like, I don't know what I'm going to teach this kid. Like he doesn't know Braille. Like, how is he going to navigate? How is he going to live a life? Well, I went back to school, everything hunky dory. I was excited to see all my friends. Cause that's what I needed. I just needed people that I recognized. I needed a school that I recognized something that was familiar to me because going blind, just like that, losing half your family is not easy. I'm sure you guys can imagine. And so when I went back to school, I found out that I had to have a teacher to teach me Braille. I had to have a teacher to teach me how to use a cane. I had a teacher to teach me how to hear. And none of this was free. None of this was cheap. All of it was expensive. My mom, just after losing her husband, her son, and one of her other sons going blind, had to pay out of pocket for all of this just so I could get an education. And the thing is, is that I was going to a private elementary school. And so technically they legally didn't have to provide these accommodations, these accessibility accommodations to me. So that's great. Well, my mom was like, there's gotta be someone else that could help us. So we go to the public school system and they say, oh yeah, we could totally provide all these for free. He just has to take a bus ride 45 minutes to like the next town over where all the blind people in the county go to school there. I couldn't go to my own school, you know, the place that was familiar for me. I had just gone blind and lost half my family. No, they wanted me to go all the way to a different school for this. And unfortunately, as this, this is the case with many accessibility slash education cases for people with disabilities, my mom had to sue the school district. And long story short, we eventually won, but I didn't really get to reap any of those benefits until we had left that school district. Um, and so fourth grade comes around while this lawsuit is going on. We, we couldn't afford the Catholic school anymore, the elementary school. We, I had to go to a public school. And this is when I began realizing how much the odds were stacked against me from the very beginning. Um, and I do not say that lightly. I say that very seriously, that the odds were stacked against me going through school all the way from elementary to now. Not, oh, elementary, middle school, and then it got better high school. Oh, it got better in college. I'm still dealing with these accessibility issues. So let me highlight this for you when I was in elementary school at public school and middle school, I had a 
TVI, Teacher for the Visually Impaired, come, I think, maybe two or three times a week. So I only could get a handful of my things converted into Braille or into an accessible, accessible format on my laptop. And the teachers didn't know how to do that. I didn't know how to write Braille. They didn't know how to make an accessible Word document, even though it's very, very simple. The point is that they were uneducated and therefore this impacted me. I was the one left with teachers giving me late assignments, not me giving teachers late assignments, teachers giving me assignments late. And so I was always behind. Um, I never got held back or anything, but it was a very, very stressful time for me. Elementary school, middle school, high school, college. I can name, this is a pattern that has continued nonstop. So for example, in high school, I had a chemistry teacher who did not like to teach me because I was blind and because he had to accommodate. He was very old. He was definitely near the end of his retirement. And so, yeah, like he's, you know, may not know how to use technology as much, but that's, it's still his job to accommodate for all the students. And so I had two years with him, biology and chemistry. And by the end of it, I was so tired. I was just so tired of asking him over and over again, can I please have this in Braille? Can I please have this on my computer? Just something so I could study. I got so desperate, everyone. I, I'm not even proud of saying this, but this is how low the lack of accessibility just in the school system impacted me. That I remember my senior year of high school, the very last day, I'm not even joking, the very last day, the very last exam, the very last question. I didn't know the answer to it, but I knew that if I didn't fill it out, because it was like a 30 point question, I knew that if I didn't fill it out, that my professor would be like, oh, you forgot to you forgot to uh, fill this out. I, and I didn't have the heart to tell him to his face, everything you have been doing hasn't helped me at all, that I've been struggling this and I, I couldn't do it, right? So I cheated. I literally cheated on the very last exam, on the very last question, because that was my last resort. Because I didn't feel confident enough in anything I knew because I didn't have the resources to actually study properly. And guess what? I got caught cheating and I got a zero on the exam and I didn't get AB honor roll. I didn't get this or that. And that was on me, but that was how depressed and low I got from not having these accessibility options. And like I said, this continued through college. I, <laughs> I had a professor in economics and I had to take an entire economic exam, someone reading it to me. The, all the graphs, all the numbers had, had to do someone reading it to me. Uh, I just took a class last semester, a statistics class, and the, uh, the online textbook, the digital textbook, did not work with my computer, with my screen reading software. I couldn't read it at all. I had to do an entire statistics class without a textbook. And see, here's the thing. When I emailed Regis, the school I'm going to right now, uh, they have a disability department, but they are not good. <laughs> That's the nicest way to say it. They are not good. You know, I can already tell from what Brent and Jasper and all of them do that. It's like, wow, this disability department knows what they're doing. Like they know about accessibility. Like, they, they don't even answer my emails at Regis. And so it's frustrating. And, but that's not the, it's not just in academia. There's accessibility everywhere. Whether you realize it or not, accessibility benefits you. I've got a few examples here. All right, let's see. Let's see, I gotta find my list of things. Okay, so have you ever used TTS, like text-to-speech, like if you're reading a textbook digitally and you want to just take a break, have your eyes take a break? Well, a lot of people use text-to-speech to have the textbook read to them. And that's exactly what I do. That's an accessibility feature. Another one, playing Pokemon. I know a lot of people play it one-handed because there's one-handed mode. My girlfriend has one hand. And so that directly benefits her. And so people say that accessibility is hard to implement. People in academia are like, that's too much work. Like, can you just partner up with someone and have them read it to you? That it takes away my independence. 
it takes away me having a voice, me being my own person, me contributing to society. Let me talk about me being a Paralympic swimmer before I jump into Animal Crossing, because I know people are curious how I play that. But me being a Paralympic swimmer, how did I get start, started with swimming? Well, I used to go to the Florida School for the Deaf and Blind. Um, I guess you can imagine why I went there because the accessibility in the public schools were awful. So I was like, this is my last resort. We're gonna go to a school for the blind. Well, guess what? I left there because they had accessibility issues. They once had make, made blind people, or not, not once, but many times had made blind people play games of volleyball with deaf people with no accommodations. I'm not against playing volleyball with deaf people, but I mean, come at least have like a bell or a beep in the ball or something so I can hear where they are. Can you imagine that? And it sounds just as ridiculous out of this as it is, because if you imagine it, it, it I'm, I would sit on the sidelines because I couldn't play. I, could, I didn't want to get hit, hit in the head with a ball. I would sit on the sidelines and then I would get in trouble for sitting on the sidelines. But the point is, is that while I was at FSDB, I learned about the Paralympics. And for those who, do, who don't know what the Paralympics are, they are the exact same thing as the Olympics, except for people with disabilities. Also not to confuse the Paralympics with the Special Olympics. So the Special Olympics is a nonprofit organization for people with cognitive disabilities. And a lot of people uh, get that confused. So I just wanted to clear that up. But so Paralympics, I swim against, I, I should mention that <laughs> I'm a Paralympic swimmer and I swim against only other people who are completely blind. And that's how it goes for pretty much every other disability in Paralympics is that there are classifications for each of your disabilities. And so pretty much while I have my YouTube channel and while I make videos about accessibility, how I do this and that gaming, uh, I spend 20 hours a week in the pool training. Um, I live about three minutes away from the Olympic and Paralympic Training Center. And that's what we, that's what I've been pretty much doing for the past three years, you know, up until the pandemic hit and all that. Um, but here's the thing, even in the Paralympics, there are accessibility issues. For example, I have an Apple watch, which by the way, talks, I can use all of it by myself independently. They have these bands called whoops and they're these high tech fitness bands that track your sleep your health data, your heart rate, your calories burned, your lap swim, da -da 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 -da, all that. And I can't use it. Meanwhile, in the weight room, they have someone else write down all of my weights instead of, you know, just sending it to me on a computer. The point I'm trying to make is that accessibility concerns, accessibility issues are everywhere. And for those who are able-bodied or not disabled, it's not like I'm, I'm not blaming you for not knowing about this, but the, the accessibility issues are so prevalent and so few people in the world know about them. Even though, like I said before, accessibility benefits everyone. Last one example I wanted to give is audio description. Netflix has audio description for many, many of its titles. And audio description, if you guys don't know, is professionally narrated or I guess I should say professionally, professional narration of content for blind people. And it's very precise. So like they'll only describe what's necessary or only describe while other people aren't talking, stuff like that. Um, and it's all pre-recorded. Let's see, the thing is, is that Netflix had to get sued for that. Hulu had to get sued for that. HBO Max just got sued for that. And that that's why I'm talking to you guys right now is because it's not helping anyone if we're having to sue people to implement accessibility. Me talking to you guys and you guys being here is what's really, it, it's gotta be societal change. It's gotta be a cultural change. And that's why I'm giving this talk. And like I've been saying, I've, accessibility benefits everyone. Sam, my girlfriend sometimes listens to audio description uh, while she's cooking or something because she can't bother to look at the TV because it's in the other room. Small things like that, are, are huge accessibility features, benefits for me, and even sometimes could be features for people who are able-bodied. And so, okay, got to preface all that. Now let's talk video games. How do I even play video games? Ross, you're blind. You can't play video games. Well, I can. I am an avid gamer. I am a hardcore gamer. I play many games competitively. Um, 
my first instance of playing video games going blind was right after I got out of the hospital. Because like I said, I was eager to get out and eager to play Pokemon. It was the hottest thing in 2006. So as soon as I got out of the hospital, was given my uh, Game Boy SP, I fired up Pokemon Ruby and I just began walking around because I wanted to hear the clicks. I wanted to hear all the Pokemon cries. I wanted to hear all the sounds because that's, that's how I function was on sound. Like that, that was my new reality, right? Well, when I was playing, I started to notice. I was like, okay, well, there's a sound when I go down once in the menu, there's a click sound or there's a sound when a Pokemon comes out and each sound is different. And there's a sound when I bump into a wall. All right, now, bumping into a wall, one, and then Pokemon just having different cries and all that, don't worry, you don't need to know anything about Pokemon, is what makes this game accessible. But specifically the bump sound, the one sound, every time I walk to the wall, boom, boom, boom. That's what allowed me to play the game because it allowed me to know when I was bumping into things and it allowed me, if, I, if, I, if there was no sound, then I wouldn't know when I was bumping into things. I'd just be going up forever. But with the bump sound there, I was, I'm able to pretty much trace a town or a city or a building because of keeping this mental map in my head. I keep this mental map in my head that where it, it's a real world thing and it even extends to video games where if I walk in a room, I'm like, okay, I don't know what's into here. But then like I bump into my chair or I bump into my table over here. And I'm like, okay, I know that's there. I can picture it in my head now. And that's what Pokemon, that's what I do with Pokemon. And that's what Pokemon helped me with. I would say that playing video games, playing Pokemon as a kid directly correlates to, or is directly caused by me being more independent, essentially. Pokemon has made me more independent because of how accessible it is, right? So I grew up playing Pokemon, not thinking that there's that there is any other game I could play. Well, then I found out that there's entire communities of blind people who play video games just by sound alone. And it's funny because I never thought of this until now, but I've, I've had able-bodied people ask me, why? <laughs> What's the point? It sounds like so much work having to memorize all the menus, memorize all the sounds, memorize all the maps. And it's like, why do you play video games? You play video games to get immersed. You play video games for socialization. You play video games for those, you know, sweet internet memes. Why, why don't I deserve that? Are you saying like, I don't deserve that just because I'm blind? I used to be able to see people. And it's not like that's where it stops is people, people with disabilities just in general deserve the same opportunities and the same experiences as people with able bodies. From what I've already told you, I did not have the same opportunities or experiences in the, in academia. I did not have the same opportunities or experiences with video games. I played Pokemon for like 10 years of my life without playing any other video game. And so that's, that's why I play video games is because it's just something I can't let go of. It makes me happy. I love getting lost in the world of a video game. I love being able to do things along my sighted counterparts. I mean, that's why I'm in the Paralympics. That's why I swim. Cause I want to be able to swim like all other sighted people. Um, and that's what accessibility is about is equal opportunities for everyone. Okay. With that being said, there's a lot of other video games I play, but Animal Crossing is a new discovery that I realize is accessible. And so I want to show you guys why. I do have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Ross Minor, where I pretty much break down every single video game that I play um, and say how I play it. That's not, I don't specifically talk about video games, but that's um, a big thing. And so we're going to fire up Animal Crossing for you guys. And I have made it my mission to create the most accessible Animal Crossing Island ever. And so whether that's accessible to deaf people, accessible to visually impaired people, accessible to people with one finger, 
I'm going to try to make it accessible. So it's not completely done, but I have made quite a lot of progress and I want to show you guys why, why am I doing this? Why it matters and just how this all works. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and fire up my switch. I have this all docked going through my computer with a capture card, my computer, my gaming computer that I built myself. What? Blind people can do that? Yeah, there, guys, I have so much I want to tell you guys, but I, there, like, there's just so much accessibility to talk about these days, good and bad. A lot of good. A lot of good. Honestly, I, I, I was just talking to this about someone on Twitter a couple of days ago, and they were like, well, accessibility, I know everything else in the world is, you know, falling apart, but accessibility is the one thing that has thrived. Um, since everything has gone virtual. So anyway, yeah, I'm gonna stop rambling. Just something I'm passionate about. All right, here's my Animal Crossing Island. I got my funky outfit on. If you ever wanna know what a blind person dresses like, now you know, I'm not just kidding. Um, but, so how do I play Animal Crossing? Well, there's no bump sound, but I can tell by listening to the footsteps when I'm running into something. So I'm walking walking I actually walked in there but that's okay I'm walking or it's loading there we go so you can hear the footsteps you can hear that I'm walking on like stone or something and then now you don't hear anything it's because I'm running into a wall All right, so now we're gonna just go back outside and I can also tell where doorways are because there's wood or like wood Harrison, Olivia left the by it um, and it creates like a wood step. Harrison, Olivia left the um, and so that's how I navigate, you know, know when I'm running into a wall, which that's very important video games. I can't memorize anything if I don't know where the boundaries are. Okay, now it's about sound and more specifically stereo sound. So. I was surprised, but a lot of people who don't use their ears as much Harrison, as I do, they don't know what stereo and mono audio is. Mono, right in front of you, doesn't move at all. Stereo is when it sounds like it's around you, or like it's from left to right, it separates. And that's what's important because then it tells me direction, where, where something is, right? Okay, without further ado, here is my island. So first off, I gotta get my bearings. All right. There's a Here the is pathway just leading right off. But then if you go right, I don't know if the audio in Zoom is mono or stereo, so keep that in mind. But if I go right on my path, I can hear that little water water trickle sound. If I get closer, that's a fountain. And the first thing, or I guess the second thing, is consistency with accessibility. And that you need consistency. There's a difference between giving someone options and having something consistent. And so given that I have to work Thompson, with the limitations leading. of Animal Crossing, I figured, whoops, what just happened? So consistency is key. and. Given that I'm working within the limitations of Animal Crossing, I had to figure out a way to let people know certain geographical locations. And so this is why I put fountains at the intersection of every single pathway. Because it may seem small, but what if you just want to pretend, what if you're blind and you want to pretend to walk along the path and like you, you like actually walk off and then it's like, I forgot I'm blind. This game isn't totally accessible. But now, you can walk along the path and know where to turn. And so that's one of the very first accessibility features we have. And so as I'm walking through my island, I'm gonna point out different things. So like over here, I have some funky music playing by almost every building to let me know where the building is. More specifically, I have it to the right of each building. So that way, because Again, consistency. What if some speakers were on the right and what if some speakers were on the left? Then people wouldn't know which way the building entrance was. All right. And so keep in mind, I'm listening to, like, I'm on stone right now. I'm, oops, I'm on the pathway right now. So I can, I'm listening to all of that. This, this is all things I have to keep track of in my mind to play this game. 
Over here, I have a fountain just because it's nice. And it's a nice landmarker to kind of, oops, didn't mean to go in here. <laughs> but it's a nice landmarker to kind of know where you are. And again, I do that all through stereo audio because right now when I walk outside, you could hear it's in front of me slash below me. But if I move to the right, now it's to my left. Again, not sure if it's mono or stereo on Zoom, but there you have it. Now, this right here, I am proud of. I won't go into the details for those who don't know how to make, how to play Animal Crossing or anything about it. But essentially, I have exactly 17 trees here, guaranteeing that if someone comes to my island, if they shake something, they will always get something out of the tree. And I do this because it's a pain for me, like to find every single tree on my island to get every single reward. It's a pain for someone who may have arthritis to go from tree to tree shaking and stuff like that. So now I can't even wait for the new pop up of the result plus new open system of scandal. Oh no, there's a boss! I'll just catch it like that. And. And now. And oh! You know, I forgot to tell you guys all this. I've done all this by myself. All of it. Because this game is that accessible. There are sound cues for everything, there are vibrations. I've built all of this myself. And here's the thing, guys. If this game weren't playable this game isn't even accessible this game is playable i wouldn't have been able to share this story with you guys and that's the thing about accessibility is that there are many untold stories that people with disabilities want to share but can't you know there 25 percent of the united states alone is disabled and video game companies school systems say oh it's not profitable it's not worth it give me a break right anyway I'm gonna show you the piece different this bones. I hope I said that right. Up here, I have like my castle, my fortress. Alright. So right here, going back. I have two waterfalls centered to let me know where, where the bridge is. And when I mean centered, I mean if I'm standing in the middle, I can hear one's in the left ear, one is in the right ear. And another accessibility feature right there. Uh, going to the shore right here, I have sand on the shore to let people know that they're by the river, because the water doesn't make a lot of sound. And these are a lot of blind features, but I also have some features um, for other disabilities that I'm excited to show. So, up here, I have a lot of fire, and that's because I have fire wherever there's a staircase. Um, and the goal was to also make this look aesthetically pleasing, and accessible to prove to game developers that you can have an accessible game and a totally normal game because apparently people are insecure about that. So up here, I have fire. I knew there are stairs here because they're in a corner, obviously, but then there's fire right here, which is useful for me. I have a nice little waterfall just to let me know that a pond is here. And I also have stones around the pond to let me know that the pond is here. This stuff has taken me so long to do. I've been working on this for months and I'm still not done. Back here I have a secret entrance. A blind secret entrance, because I bet you guys can see that. But <laughs> no, but um, I even have my trees organized a specific way so I can just, once I find it, shake, move on, shake, move on, shake, move on. I know where all of them are because they're too there are two tiles apart, I'm pretty sure, horizontally, and then three tiles vertically. And again, consi consistency. If we don't have complete accessibility, then the best, next best thing in video games is consistency. And, alright, so now, I have to, you're probably wondering how I knew even where that was. It's because I had to memorize it. Like, it takes a lot of memorization for games like these. Or just for all games, what am I talking about? And so here, right here, is a tiny accessibility feature that I like. <clears throat> um, even though it may not seem like much, I'm so proud that I thought of this. And that's, I made this kind of like a cool little secret staircase, but I also made it very, very easy to get up because I don't want people who have joint problems have a hard time doing all these twists and turns, right? So like over here, this is something I need to fix. This is something I need to like patch so to say. Because I don't want someone to have to walk, go turn, 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 like that could hurt. Um and then at little you can see I have my fire right there. Um and so 
basically the reason why I know my island so well is because I've made it. Um, I'm trying to think like, oh yeah, how do I uh, even manage my inventory? Because this is a big part about playing video games, just in general, is reading the text on the screen. So, I see I have things here. Yeah, and so, first off, tiny little accessibility feature, these click sounds are in stereo. So I can hear which side of the menu I'm on. Because like right there, I'm on the right side. And then you can hear it pop back over to the left when I'm on the left side. But now here's some cool technology for you guys. And this is called OCR, and it stands for Optical Character Recognition. And <clears throat> essentially, it takes, this is all done through my screen reader, it's an add-on, and it takes the picture of the screen and then tries to extract the text from it. Just the text so I can read it. Let's see, I want to make sure I show you guys every single part of the island. Just because, you know, I'm proud of it. I, I worked really hard on this, and I, I stream on Twitch. So if you guys want to come visit my island, I stream every Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Um, I don't stream specifically Animal Crossing. I play a bunch of other video games, and you guys can ask about those during the Q&A. Um, yeah, this, look how seamless, seamlessly I'm navigating. Because all it takes is a little bit of sound, it's just a little bit of effort. People are saying accessibility is hard to implement. It's not. All it takes is a couple sounds. And look at this. I'm playing this game like like a sighted person, honestly. And I have these little waterfalls right here at the corner of my moat to let me know when I'm at the corner. And why do I have this giant wall here? Like, Ross, this looks, this looks ugly. This is like what a blind person would actually think. Well, whenever I'm creating a pathway, it's very difficult for me to stay straight. And so I create a sort of stencil around it, right? So I know where to fill it in. Well, here, I'm, I keep rambling, but I swear this will be my last thing. But <clears throat> part of the issue is, is that the game is a grid, but it doesn't act like a grid. It doesn't act like it's two dimensional or like, you know, just a grid. Um, instead, you know, like you could do twists and turns. Well, let me show you a potential accessibility feature that could be implemented in, I swear, two seconds. And the reason I'm showing you guys this is because it goes to show you how easily it is to implement accessibility and that the problem isn't accessibility, the problem is the culture, the perception around it. People thinking that, oh, it's difficult, blah, blah, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Ross, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, just a quick heads up on on time. Uh, yep. It's three forty four. All right. Um, so just, just for reference. <laughs> yep. I, you know, okay. I'll stop. I'll stop. But the point is, is that they can make this a grid if they wanted to. So they can make it. If I press left once, I go left once. You know, stuff like that. Um, but it's just a matter of talking to people about it, getting attention, and blind people, people with disabilities. You know, we're minorities. <laughs> My last name is Minor, but yeah, I'm a minority. So like, yeah, that's that's why accessibility is important. That's why we need to advocate. And we need I need help from people who care about it, like all of you who are joining. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> I will stop. I love talking about it. And yeah, I don't want to go over time. Yeah, seriously, <laughs> I'm just so passionate about this. I really just want you guys to have the same passion I do. And... Yeah, Q&A. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Ross. Um, <laughs> just due to the volume of folks we had here, was it isn't feasible to turn everybody's mics on. Um, so if you have a question you'd like to ask Ross, please um, use the hand raise feature. Um, I believe if you go, I can't see it on my end, um, <laughs> but it is there somewhere in the controls at the bottom, um, and we'll, we'll we'll read the questions to Ross as they as they come in. We've also got some questions some folks asked beforehand as well. Yeah, absolutely, guys. Feel free to ask any questions. Hand raise feature is accessible. Wow, look at that! Benefits everyone. <laughs> But as far as other games, I play, I play Hades, Pokemon, The Last of Us 2, Mortal Kombat, Animal Crossing, um, Call of Duty, 
Super Smash Brothers. I, this is, I'm sorry to interrupt. This is actually no, no, working a little fine, differently fine. than I thought that it would. Um, I have, I'm just going to unmute the folks that have questions as, as we go here. Um, so I have Jeff, first up with a, a question for you, Ross. Hey, um, I was wondering if you've been in contact with any of the video game developers and have they shown an interest in making their yes. games a little bit more accessible? Yes, yes. The Last of Us 2 is the first AAA game to be fully accessible by pretty much all disabilities. I've beaten the game 100% from beginning to end without any sighted help whatsoever. A first person shooter. And there's an entire community of blind people, including myself, who are pretty much spearheading this movement with game developers. So we, I'm not trying to like toot my own horn, but we have contacts with EA games. We have contacts with Microsoft, Ubisoft. Those are, the top three I would say that are working on accessibility. And there are a lot of other game companies who aren't doing diddly about it. So it is a big perception thing. You know, there's a lot of variance. Thank you. Um, next question is from Emily. And Emily, I have just given you permission to unmute if you'd like to ask your question or if you wanna type it in the chat, I can read it as well, whichever works better for you. Hi, I really loved seeing your island. Um, oh, yeah. I'm also an Animal Crossing fanatic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, do you have a dream code that you'd be willing to share? I I will create one. I have not yet because I'm a perfectionist. And I'm like, I'm not going to share my island until it's completely done. But it's like, I just, I can't wait anymore. Like, I have to share with people. People keep asking me about it. So if you have any social media or just any way of contacting me, um, I will tweet it out or something. I use Twitter like crazy. I will tweet it out um, and hopefully you see it. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. Um, let's see here. Let me see if there's any other hands up right now. No, it's okay. I've got quite a few questions here. Um, do you find that there are any skills that you have learned through gaming that have... Um, enabled you or that have benefited you in Paralympic swimming training? I realize the two are, you know, there's, there's a seeming gap <laughs> between the two, but not perhaps as big as some oh. may think. <laughs> okay. So I see like off the top of my head, is, is there anything that's helped me Paralympics? I, yeah. Uh, I would say a lot of timing video games where you have to like be on beat or something. A lot of stuff like that translates really well into swimming. We have these things called TikToks where we wrap them around our waist and they, they like tick and talk every time you shift your hips when you rotate and you know, stuff like that. Like just, uh, there's, there's a game called sequence storm, which is like a rhythm based game, which is, have, has been made accessible for the blind and it's a rhythm based game. And yeah, stuff like that translates really well, um, throughout what I do. Thank you. Um, I have a question from Carmen. Uh, when you're speaking about businesses that don't think about accessibility or, mm -hmm. or perhaps uh, you know, disregard it, what recommendations do you have, if any, for bringing that to someone's attention? You just got to email and tweet and email and tweet and email and tweet because that's how that's if it's a tiny business, then you'll have a lot of luck. But if it's something like Walmart or stuff like that the unfortunate thing is is that the national federation of the blind um and the american council of the blind sue them over and over again there there are so many organizations mainstream very popular organizations that have gotten sued over and over again for uh being inaccessible and but all we can do is just keep reaching out and spreading awareness and uh what was i going to say Essentially, like, yeah, we, people have to, we have to keep suing them. And that's not spreading awareness, essentially. So. No, thank you. And it, it's, it, that, that, that is the, the one thing that I have learned in, in this line of work and in with my own disabilities, which yeah. are not sensory or drastically, drastically different, yes. Um, yes. is that it, it is constant self-advocacy. Um, and 
absolutely can be exhausting at times. Exhaust, <laughs> exhausting. Yes. Exhausting. Yes. yes. Um, <laughs> I have a great question here from from Kelsey, and this is something I have wondered myself. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I was gonna gonna follow up to you just outside of this, out of curiosity, because mm -hmm. some stuff in folks in the industry I've talked to. Have you used any virtual reality headsets before? And how have you found that experience with the headset? I have a video where I give my girlfriend a Oculus Quest last Christmas and she has one hand and she's not huge into the accessibility movement. Like she, she supports it and everything, but I threw on some headphones and like, yeah, the audio is very useful. I, there have, are avenues being paved for accessibility in VR. In fact, I have worked with someone from Shell Games. I don't know much about VR, so I'm not sure how big they are in the VR community, but Shell Games, and I'm pretty good friends with him now, and he's a developer, and he wanted to know how to make things more accessible. Um, and so VR accessibility is definitely on the horizon. Like five years ago, video game accessibility wasn't even on the horizon. So it's, it's, a snowball really that's what it is um next question uh thank you very much um we have a lot of uh, folks in the audience that are in uh, preparing to become teachers do you have a a single piece of advice that you think would be the most important thing for them to walk away with here as they prepare to, to enter the field yes every i feel like i'm not a teacher but i feel like when you're learning to be a teacher, you, you know that every kid has different needs. And this extends to disabilities. It doesn't stop there. E each kid with disabilities has different needs. And it's okay for you to not, if you have a blind person coming, if, for you to not know Braille. It, that, it's not on you to know Braille. But it is on you to make sure that kid is getting all the education you needed or that they need. Like, I've had teachers where... I've had to threaten to get them fired for not serving me. And then I have had other teachers who are amazing and I have had no issues with them at all. So the biggest difference is just having empathy and knowing everyone is different and just being there for your kids. Like, I, I don't know, I don't wanna rant, but I don't know what possesses some teachers to just be like, oh, just listen. Like, oh, we, you don't know what's on the board, just listen. <laughs> I don't know, but I would say, yeah, just, just ask, have an open line of communication. I mean, that's really what it is. Communication, like corporations aren't communicating with us about making their things accessible. Thanks, Ross. And that question was from Michelle. Thank you. Um, got a question here from um, uh, Broca. Do you shop online generally using screen readers? And what has your experience, I'm gonna tack onto that, what has your experience been like <laughs> with the average shopping website? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so shopping online, a lot of times I have to ask Sam, hey, what does this look like? Hey, what does this look like? Because some things that I shop for, like I, I have to feel, that's my way of seeing. Like when I got this Apple Watch, like I desperately wanted to like pre-order it and have it delivered to me, but it's like, it's a $500 watch. Like I gotta, I have to go feel it and like, see what it's like before I buy it. Um, and so a lot of times, yeah, like sometimes I just can't use Amazon and like, <sighs> that's a whole other accessibility thing right there. It's like, imagine if Amazon had like descriptions for the blind, that would be incredible. Like alt text, except for, you know, shopping. So yeah. Um, but a lot of other things shopping wise, like I don't have trouble with, it just depends on the nature of whatever I'm buying. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I've, I've, that, that is something I've heard a lot of, of folks uh, indicate, e even from, from other accessibility issues that, that the assistive technology may not be as, as complex. Um, you know, I think a lot of people hear screen reader and people that can't use mouse um, assume that that's you know, a, somebody with vision impairment. There's people you know, with motor skills issues out there as well. Um, mm -hmm. and, and yeah, basic keyboard navigation on Amazon is, is bad. It's, oh, it's, yeah. it's, it's so bad. It is so bad. You, but it's, 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 it's bad. Mm -hmm. um, yes. I um, have a great question here from Elise. Do you think you will ever develop your own video game? Is that a goal that you have? And, um, or, and or do you foresee yourself helping others to make their games accessible? Yes. 
Yes. Like that, if I can have my dream job, that would, that would be what it is. And right now I'm going to Regis for um, software engineering because I figured if, if no one is going to step up, I'm going to be the change. Like I'm like, I wish I could be a software engineer with lawyers. Like either you make this accessible, I'm going to tell you how, or I'm going to sue you. You're going to make it accessible some way or another, but, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's something I do want to do. Great. Um, and that, that is uh, kudos to you. I have seen most of the development interfaces and they are certainly not by default accessible, uh, no, which is a whole no. other challenge that I don't think is, is perhaps folks that have let, listened here today are, are picking up on that now that things yeah. are just not yeah. made for all. Um, mm -hmm. Got a question, another question here from Carmen. Um, do you enjoy games that have dialogue in them? Uh, do you have a preference on type of game and whether the dialogue in them helps? So as it currently is right now in my life, I'm almost like a beggar in that I can't be a chooser because there are so few games that are accessible for me. That being said, like if I had to pick, I, I actually not a huge fan of dialogue. Um, I don't know, maybe it's because I have ADHD and I just want to like play, play, play. But like even playing Pokemon, I skip past all the dialogue. Obviously like I couldn't read it, but I didn't, it didn't take away from my experience or like Hades. There's a lot of dialogue in there. I kind of skip some of it or like the last of us two where like that's a primarily story driven game i'm just like oh let me get to the combat like that because i feel like that's the most impressive part about accessibility so that's i guess that's why i enjoy those kinds of games more great thank you um have I think we have time for one last question here and this comes from uh dr heidi feng and uh, that question is, what tools do you use for accessing charts and other vi visual illustration? Yeah, so it depends entirely on the class, like if it's statistics versus algebra. But like I have, ooh, where is it? I think I have it in here, a graphing calculator. I can't find it right now, but somewhere in my desk, I have a graphing calculator that speaks to me. And like, even when it's like reading a line, on a graph, it, it does it through audio and vibration. So this is like, woo, like that. And it's really cool, I love it. Um, but then other things like Excel, in case anyone didn't know this, Microsoft does a lot for accessibility, pretty much all of their things are accessible at this point, similar to Apple. Kind of Apple had that reputation in the past, but now it's Microsoft, so like Excel, uh, I don't really have many issues with Word, PowerPoint, I can do all that. Um, but math is very tactile. So there are times where I, I got to bust out a braille writer or a bust out a braille graph to like picture it in my mind. Cause it, cognitive load of just doing it all in your mind is ridiculous, so. Thank you. Um, it is 3.59, um, we're about out of time. And I said that was the last one, but I'm gonna ask one more that came from our, our registration from Florentia. Do you find that one of the major consoles is more accessible in general than the others amongst Switch, uh, Xbox, yeah. PlayStation? All right. I rant about this all the time on Twitter. Like, if you want all of this, go to Twitter. Because, you know, console wars among able-bodied people, and then there's console wars among disabled people. Because right now, the Xbox has... Uh, uh, a text-to-speech software on it. I can use all the Xbox menus, read them all, message people, join parties. I can't do any of that on a PS4. However, The Last of Us 2 was a PS4 exclusive. <laughs> right. <laughs> so guess who went out and bought a PS4 I for one game? <laughs> Me. <laughs> I've been there, done that. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I prefer Microsoft by far, but um, it definitely seems like there are more developers on Sony who are embracing accessibility. So only time will tell, honestly, with the Xbox, the new Xbox, the new, new PS4. As far as Nintendo, um, they're almost a lost cause. Like the, the harsh reality of it is, is that business culture in Japan is much different than here. They are so, like, we think we're far behind on disabilities. Like it's even more taboo over there. Um, so like that, that's not even, I'm not even going to touch that with a 10 foot pole until Microsoft and Sony get their act together, you know, then maybe Nintendo may follow along. 
Great. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I am actually probably going to follow <laughs> up with you on that because I there are some interesting things culturally that I'm like, hold on. How oh, is yeah. it that you guys invented the raised blocks on the road? Yeah. And everything yeah else. Exactly. So at any rate, <laughs> it is four o'clock. And, and with that, thank you so much, Ross. We really appreciate your time. Um, we, we, uh, everyone, we did record this. I'm not certain how long we'll be till it's available. We may need to, to take some portions out or anything um, here and there. But uh, if you were one of the couple of people that spoke, please let me know if you have a concern about your, your, your voice being in the recording. But otherwise, um, we kept this largely um, cameras and, and mics off for partially for that reason. Mm. Um, thank you all again for your time. Um, we, we, as in my team in OTS and the Campus Accessibility SIG, are hoping to um, promote further events like this. This, um, you may be hearing from Ross again. In fact, in the future, yeah. we'll see. So yeah. <laughs> thank you all. And if you have any questions about accessibility at TU, please feel free to uh, reach out to ADS if it's something in your courses. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, um, we've got s several resources from OTS Accessibility for faculty and staff. Um, our ADA coordinator, Lauren Evans, if there's if you've got any kind of other issues on campus is available as well. And with that, have a wonderful rest of your afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.